Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Roberts provides a four-part introduction to clinical mycology, including culture and identification of organisms encountered in the clinical practice. This is part three in the series. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sharon, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. This is another series and introduction to clinical mycology, the third in a series of four presentations. Part one was diagnosis and classification and general features of the fungi and fungal infections. Part two was the basic structures of molds and yeast and a brief introduction to culture. Part 3 presents specific information on the culturing and incubation of cultures for the optimal recovery of fungi, and we'll cover this today. This slide shows a culture variation of Cryptococcus neoformans on different media showing that it's medium dependent, and that's something that we emphasized in the previous presentation, emphasizing that you must not only select the right media, but you also must know what the organisms look like as they grow on those particular media to help with the identification. We have shown in the past that we need certain compounds to added to the culture media to allow us to recover the organisms that we want to find in mycology. And the reason for that is that there are bacterial overgrowth in, some, in many instances because the specimens that we get for culture are often contaminated. Genomycin and chloramphenicol are two antibiotic set can be used in combination to inhibit many of the bacteria that will allow the fungi to grow through uh, on fungal media. Ciprofloxacin can be added to culture media and that is used to try to inhibit the growth of things like Pseudomonas. Cyclohexamide, another name is Actidione, is a compound that we will see in just a moment here that is used for preventing the rapid overgrowth uh, by some molds of slower growing molds. And then there are certain instances where we use media that contains sheep blood enrichment because the organisms may require a bit more enrichment before they'll be able to be recovered. Cyclohexamide is a compound that is used primarily only in culturing. It's not an antibiotic for any treatment of any disease at all, but it allows for one to prevent the overgrowth of slowly growing moles by others that grow more rapidly. And we deal with certain things like the dimorphic fungi they grow some, for the most part, slower than things like Aspergillus or some of the other fungi. And cyclohexamide partially inhibits the growth of those rapidly growing molds so that we can pick up and see the growth of slower growing molds that are known pathogens. And the dimorphic fungi are primarily the ones that we are trying to recover and prevent the rapid growth of growth by rapidly growing molds. And cyclohexamide allows us to do that. However, there is a problem using cyclohexamide, and that is that certain of the pathogenic fungi may be inhibited by cyclohexamide, and it's necessary to use a medium that lacks that compound along with it. This is an example of some of the fungi, and certainly the list is by no means complete, of fungi that are inhibited by cyclohexamide. Aspergillus fumigatus, Cryptococcus neoformans, Pseudalasheria boydi, Canada Cruzia and Trichosporon species. And I'll just point out a new name that has just recently been introduced. Canada Cruzia has had a name change, and I doubt that it will be a name that will be used by everyone, but it is called Pichia Cudria Zevii. And if you see this in anything, you'll know that it's a, just a new name for Canada Cruzia. The trichosporon species also can be inhibited by cyclohexamide. So we use this compound to help us with the slower growing moles. This is the example of Aspergillus fumigatus. And on the plate on the right hand side, the culture dish shows no growth. This is a, the culture plate that contains cyclohexamide. If we were looking for a, that organism causing aspergillosis in a patient and we only use that particular medium, we would miss it. It would not grow and we would never see it and so we would miss the diagnosis. So the two plates that lack cyclohexamide you can see grow aspergillus fumigatus very well. This is aspergillus niger. If we had a patient who had disease caused by aspergillus niger, we would never recover it on the plate at the bottom 
because that plate contains cyclohexamide, the other two would, since it lacks cyclohexamide. So cyclohexamide is used for compound used in the right way. This is coccidioides. These are colonies of coccidioides, except for the one on the left-hand side about 9 o'clock that is bright white. All the other colonies are coccidioides imitis on a culture plate that came from a contaminated specimen. And cyclohexamide allowed those colonies that were slower growing to be able to grow without uh, being inhibited by a rapidly growing mold. Something that was developed many years ago is a medium called Smith's medium. It simply is using a compound called ammonium hydroxide to treat contaminated specimens. And there are times when specimens submitted by mail take a long time to get to a place and to the laboratory and they contain a number of contaminants and things that will overgrow the very thing you're trying to find. Basically, this is an example of one of those plates where you tried to culture something and everything in the world is on that plate, probably including what you're looking for, it's just you can't find it. You notice this has a number of notes on there. Someone saw something in the clinical specimen and said to save the plate because they were going to try to recover it, but it grew everything except what they were looking for. So what Smith's medium allows you to do is to take ammonium hydroxide, a small amount, and place it on the side of the culture dish after it's been inoculated by the clinical specimen. And as you know, ammonium hydroxide is a very volatile compound. What happens is it spreads quickly across the plate. And as it does, it forms a concentration gradient from the highest concentration where the drop is as it spreads further distally it becomes less and it's like an antibiotic disc and it allows things to be able to be recovered. This happens to be blastomyces that was recovered from the clinical specimen and if you look on the right hand side of the plate you can see bacterial colonies along there along with some of the fungal colonies and it gets further across to the left hand side of the plate there are just fungal colonies there and it allowed that organism to be recovered whereas it would have been missed probably or not grown well at all in a plate that didn't have the ammonium hydroxide added to it. You notice that what we've shown you before here has been culture dishes, and there certainly are advantages and disadvantages to using these. In laboratories with little experience, it's probably not a very good idea. It's a risky uh, situation to use culture plates. But in a laboratory that does a moderate to great volume of fungal cultures, these culture plates allow you to have a large surface area for the isolation of colonies, and it provides good aeration of colonies. It's certainly easier to make a microscopic mount by just simply opening up a, a culture dish and making a mount. One of the problems is it's easier to get these plates contaminated. An open system is less safe to hand out of a laboratory. And culture dishes uh, are apt to dry out unless you use deep pour plates. And deep pour plates are meant to be like 40 milliliters of culture medium or more. This is an example of how culture dishes can dry out, and if that happens, the plate's virtually useless, and you happen to be in areas where the humidity is very low, you'll have this problem. So deep, poor culture dishes are preferred, and culture dishes work fine as long as you work in the biological safety cabinet. Uses of tubes for cultures, the advantage or disadvantage of those, well, culture tubes, certainly uh, you have less dehydration because generally the lids are kept tight. And you have a lack of isolation of colonies in there because when you inoculate the tube, the sustenance all runs to the bottom or the butt of the slant, and everything grows in one place. If the caps are tightened, no air is going to be able to get in, no oxygen will get in there, and the cultures will become non-viable. So the lids need to be left slightly ajar. Culture tubes are certainly safe to handle, and in most instances they're safe to handle because people do tighten the caps on so nothing can get out, and you can't do that. It's very difficult to make a mount from down inside one of those tubes. can be done, but it is not easy, and certainly a culture plate is easier for that to happen. This is an example of a culture tube. You can see all the growth is concentrated in the areas down at the butt of the slant. Not a very useful situation unless you happen to have a pure culture. The incubation of cultures. Fungal cultures pretty much grow best at 30 degrees centigrade, and that's what we recommend as a temperature for growth of trying to recover these organisms. The humidity needs to be high because otherwise the media will begin to dry out. We mentioned earlier culture plates need to be about 40 milliliters in volume. And once something grows, the plates need to be taped. They need to be taped at the beginning of incubation to prevent the lid from, from coming off and preventing a spill. And if you use tubes, you need to use a large bore tube 
gives you much more surface area for the slant in the butt. And when you inoculate the tube with clinical specimen, you need to place it on its side so that the slant is facing up horizontally. Allow that to sit for 30 to 45 minutes so that the specimen is allowed to soak into the auger and then the organism will grow without everything running to the bottom. Most places just simply don't take the time to do this. In terms of incubation of cultures, you can incubate the cultures and incubators in any way you like. At Mayo Clinic, what we use are cafeteria trays, and you notice that all of the culture dishes are placed in bags and sealed. There is a reason for this. It prevents dehydration, but it also allows us to work safely with the cultures, and we can read those plates through the bags without having to take them out. And this is the example of taking a tray out at a time. You can pick the cultures up, look at them on the front side, the reverse side. You can look at the morphology, and then if you have to work with them, you work with them inside of a biological safety cabinet. If you happen to have a culture that grows up a significant pathogen or an organism that grows a lot of uh, volume of an organism that's going to contaminate your incubator, you need to seal the plate with tape if you plan to keep it for any length of time. If it's something that you've already identified and it's, it looks like it's going to be a problem, you can simply just autoclave it. But if you're going to keep it for a significant period of time, make sure you tape it up with oxygen permeable tape. There's a problem that you run into sometimes, a mighty big problem, and you can see that these happen to be media mites. Media mites get into cultures and they can contaminate one plate from another. I often joke and say, you know how you can tell if you have mites in your cultures? You look for their tracks, and you can see their tracks as they walk through a culture. And it's interesting, some of these mites have a preference for which organism they like to eat. And in our laboratory, it happens to be penicillium. And they will walk through a colony of penicillium and then walk around the culture plate. And you can see later at where they walk, you see tiny colonies appearing as they walk around. So that's another reason that they're in sealed bags. Well, this is the finish of part three, this is the introduction to clinical mycology. Part four will include methods for identification of fungi, primarily the moles, and some helpful hints for working in laboratories.